Okay. Do we have most of you back? Great. Okay, we're going to move um, very shortly on to our final um, keynote speaker of the day, um, who is going to absolutely re-emphasize what I'm about to say to you now <laughs> and I have had uh, people have come up and, and spoken to me about some concerns that are still amongst you that we are veering into discussions on child protection programming rather than child safeguarding so what I wanted to emphasize at this point is that this is entirely about child safeguarding it's not about child protection programming. It's not about what you're doing out there to build the systems or support the families, etc., etc. It's about looking at your own organization and the harm that your organization might be doing to children. Now, that harm can come from your staff, associates, or volunteers. It can come because you have poorly designed your programs, okay, so that you haven't thought through whether your programs have an adverse impact on children. And it can come from your operations. So it can come from the sponsorship programs you might be running. It can come from the way that you use children's images and stories and how you hold children's information. That's what we're looking at here in these three days. It's about us doing no harm. The sessions that you have been involved in, although it might seem as it's predominantly about NGOs doing no harm, we're not just talking about NGOs. We are talking about any organization or institution that has contact with children or impacts on children. It might be government departments, government services, schools, it could be the private sector, companies, all of that as well as the NGO or the aid and development sector. That's what we're looking at here. So if there is any, still any confusion, please come and speak to me in the break so I can speak to you more about it. But that's what I want us to, you know, to get to that point now, midway through the conference, that we're looking at our organisations, our impact on children, and where we might be exposing them to risk of harm. 
and Richard Powell, who I'm about to introduce, will reinforce that more than ever because <laughs> his whole presentation is there's nothing but safeguarding. So let me uh, introduce my esteemed colleague, uh, Richard Powell, who's the Director of Child Safeguarding in Save the Children. Richard leads the implementation of child safeguarding across all offices, functions and country programs. In addition, he supports this work within the 30 Save the Children member organisations. Richard leads a small global team, who are all here, working across the various regions. Prior to this, he undertook a similar role for Save the Children UK. Richard has a background in statutory childcare, court-based welfare, juvenile justice, children's rights and community development. Richard is also a long-standing both member and board member of Keeping Children Safe. So, Richard Powell. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you very much for that introduction and that welcome. And um, the first thing I'd like to do this afternoon is just to give a big thanks to Keeping Children Safe for giving me this privilege. And I do choose my words carefully because I do believe that this is a privilege to speak in this place, in this conference, and to this audience. Um, all week long, probably like you, I've been pinching myself because this is probably the most beautiful conference venue I've ever been to with the most welcoming of staff and, and colleagues. Um, so I'm, I'm just pinching myself that, that I am actually here doing this. Um, but also, this conference, now, uh, as we've just heard, this is a child safeguarding conference. I've been to many, many, many conferences all across the world on different topics, but to have a meeting like this, a conference like this, on child safeguarding. When I started uh, my first engagement with Keeping Children Safe many years ago now, I, I think myself and all the other members uh, then would only have dreamed of having uh, a conference specifically on child safeguarding at a venue like this. And with an audience, um, I think we saw yesterday that this is genuinely at least a pan-African audience uh, and a global audience e even more. And an audience where there is this real commitment to making Africa and to making the world a safer place for children through making our own organizations and our own organizations' activities, all of them, safe for children. As I say, I, I do feel privileged and grateful to be here. And uh, I'd just like to say thank you for, to those who've enabled me to get here. Uh, all of those within the Say the Children family who've helped me. Uh, my team, most of the team are here. Uh, and it, it's great because sometimes this job can be uh, quite an isolated job. But it's really good for probably the first time in many years to feel a real global team building. So that's great. Now, there is one member of the team who isn't here, unfortunately, uh, our coordinator, who is, I believe, watching this online and it's being streamed online. So um, Pamela Quinn, our coordinator, has actually managed to get that bunch of people all together in the same place from different parts of the world, which is, which is um, if you knew them, uh, is some task. So um, there are a couple of things I'd like to say to Pam, who I hope is watching. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. No, I haven't yet forgotten anything, haven't lost anything, and yes, there is a present on the way. <laughs> And we've heard talk of us being on a journey, and we, and we are, are on a journey. Nobody's pretending that, that we, we've, we've cracked it. Nobody's pretending that we've reached that point where we can all say, yes, our organizations are entirely child safe at all the time. So we are on a journey. And I'd like to thank the people who've helped Save the Children and Save the Children International to move along this journey. 
because we have come a, a long way. Um, certainly keeping children safe through their work in, in developing international standards have helped our thinking. I hope we've helped you in, in your thinking and I've, there's been a great working relationship. Hope it continues after my speech. Um, <laughs> But keeping children safe have, have helped us move forward. And also there are other individuals, some of them are here, uh, you know who you are, but you are the people that have helped us move forward. And uh, standing here today, I do get a genuine real sense of standing on the shoulders of these other people. These are the people who have laid the foundations and who have enabled me to be in this position to talk like this. So I, I do feel as if I am standing on the shoulders of others and it's a big thank you to you all. And finally before I, I start the talk, um, which is overdue by now, uh, <laughs> I have to say it's been a real roller coaster within Save the Children International over the last couple of years. What you may not know is that we have somehow or other successfully integrated our international programs operation while still maintaining the membership uh, ac across the globe. And that transition to uh, an unified international program has taken, taken an enormous amount of effort over the last few years. And on top of that then, uh, in some parts of the organization, we had another INGO, a new UK-based INGO, join the Save the Children International family as well. So one of my colleagues there suddenly found out in September that she had a couple of months or three months to train four and a half thousand people spread across the world who'd never heard of the word child safeguarding. So when I say it's been a real roller coaster, it, it, it has been uh, a very challenging. But also, I hope you'll see in the talk that uh, there has been progress as well. So it's in that spirit of thankfulness and in the spirit of sharing, because all I'm doing really is sharing some of the reflections, some of the experiences. Um, I hope you'll find them helpful, but please don't think that I'm preaching at you. This is in, in the spirit of thankfulness and, and sharing. Okay. Um, I think this is a good time to say that um, I've got three children. They're all grown up. Uh, one of them is a pessimist. My eldest is a bit of a pessimist. With her, the glass is always half empty. There's always more that should be done. She worries about this, that, and the other. My youngest is a pragmatist. He doesn't really care if the glass is half full or half empty. As long as there's something to drink in the glass, he'll drink from the glass. So, and then my middle one, my, my middle daughter, uh, she's an optimist, and probably we we are uh, closer like that because I believe I'm a bit of an optimist as well. And. You'll see in the talk that I will be spending more time talking about the progress and the things that have helped us move forward than the challenges. And you can see that I've already outlined 10 areas of progress and also 10 areas of challenge. Now, how clever was Richard to do that, do you think? <laughs> huh? Isn't that perfectly formed? Well, the point is, of course, that for every area of progress, if you look at it the other way around, if the glass is half empty, there is still a huge challenge remaining. Everything that I'm saying has been progress is partial progress. As I said, nobody's absolutely cracked this yet. So everything I talk about in terms of progress remains a challenge at the same time. Now I'm gonna talk for a while and hopefully at the last sort of quarter of an hour, keep time, you know what I'm like. Um, I, I can go on a little um, and so we'll have some questions and discussions later on. Okay, the 10 themes of progress uh, are probably the single most important one is a journey that we've made from denial to determination and this is where our leaders have been so important. This is a leader's tale, and we'll talk about that. Crucially for us on this journey and in this progress is the issue of what actually do we mean by safeguarding? 
what it isn't, what it is, and probably more important, what it could become. So the potential for child safeguarding. And as we've heard just now, this is genuine an area of oh, there's progress, but still challenge remaining. Now, most of you are too young to remember the board game Snakes and Ladders. Um, you've got your iPads, your fancy this, that, fiddly, fiddly things. Um, I remember playing board games as a child. And one of the board games I used to play was Snakes and Ladders, where you you roll a dice and you gradually climb to the top of the board and you go up on ladders and every now and again you hit a snake and you slide all the way down to the bottom. And sometimes, looking back over eight to ten years in this field, there have been times when I felt that we're really on the ladder and we're getting to the top of the board. And then something happens and you just slide all the way back down. So we'll talk about that for a little bit. Bringing safeguarding from the margins, from an add-on activity, from something that you remember to do after you've done everything else, right in to the mainstream, the daily managerial workings of our organizations. And we've also seen some progress, some progress in increasing confidence that we know what we're talking about, being confident about what we know and what we don't know. And compliance, as we'll see, is just one part of it. It is more than that. It's got to be more than that. This has got to be about hearts and minds. It can't just be uh, about being compliant with the policies, about living the mission. And so, very slowly, what we are trying to do is to build a real culture of child safeguarding that we all are part of. Now, moving from isolation to inclusion might sound a little bit like margins to mainstream, but there are some specific things there that I'd like to talk about. And talking about talking, there are some really difficult conversations. Anybody who's been in the child safeguarding world will know that from time to time, some of the conversations that we have are extremely difficult. And so the whole issue of communication and turning those difficult conversations into positive communication is a really huge challenge and a step forward. And we've spent a lot of time this year really trying to work hard at this. Um, you might have noticed that downstairs we've, we've got a, a display um, Pam ordered the display, it's arrived, it's safe, Pam. Um, but you will notice that there is a very, very clear message in all of those materials, save the children, safe for children. And that's one of the things that we've been striving at this, this year, is just getting a very simple but very clear message across. We talked about resources this morning, and I'd like to talk around the issues and this is still a big struggle. Why is resourcing child safeguarding such a difficult issue sometimes? And then finally, is that 10? I think it is. Uh, share, sharing across the sector. Now, this is genuinely one area where I've worked with other INGOs, NGOs, different people, and this is the one area where people can put down their organizational priorities and genuinely share, particularly when you've got a difficult issue. So um, there's been great sharing, and it's exemplified by the conversations and the work that we've been doing together. In terms of the challenges, as I've said, Everything we're talking about in progress can be a challenge. So it's all of the above in terms of challenges, but there are some areas of particular concern that I would like to address towards the end of my speech. So save the children, moving towards being safe for children. Let's look now at some of the progress that we've seen, not just within Save the Children, but also across the sector. And as I was saying, the, the most fundamental point is this issue of moving from denial to determination. Just consider 
about 10 years ago, maybe just a little bit more, the furious reaction to some of the research that was coming out in some parts of, of Western Africa. And the, the anger at, at, uh, at some of this research. Just consider how much we're reading about nowadays of some agencies uh, where instead of addressing the issue, they've denied the issue, or they've moved the issue on, or they've hoped that the issue will go away and not appear during their tenure. So I've, I've seen a real move from denial towards determination. And for me, progress has happened when our leaders have openly engaged this. Now, a lot of our leaders dealt with this in a rather um, quiet and confidential way in the past. But our leaders now are prepared to be determined. And it's quite common to hear chief executives talking about not on my watch, that sort of phrase, or a zero tolerance approach. And a zero tolerance approach not only for deliberate acts by staff members, but also accidental acts where children have been harmed or placed in the way of harm. I was really pleased to hear my own chief executive, Jasmine Whitbread, uh, recently say very candidly that in an agency as complex as Save the Children International, working in the range of places where we work with the vulnerabilities and the instabilities that are our terrain, that it would be very surprising if we didn't come across issues around safeguarding, issues that really challenge the organization. And my own view is that if we don't accept that, if we believe that uh, it just won't happen to us, as organizations, we are actually deluding ourselves. We are lying to ourselves and to our supporters and to the people that we work with. This is a time for honesty, and I've seen that, and that's been good. Because denying this is dangerous for children, it's dangerous for our staff, and it's dangerous for our organizations and our credibility. And addressing this openly is a huge step forward. And uh, Save the Children International now has been going for a couple of years, and this year's annual report, whenever it comes out, will, for the first time in Save the Children International's history, include a section in the trustees' report on the child safeguarding allegations that we've had against our staff and partners and some detail about what the outcomes were. So we felt that that was a step forward. Other people have been doing it, but we're a relatively new organization uh, and, and we're doing that now. Well, what makes our leaders, what makes a leader engage? Uh, and sometimes it's listening to victims, and sometimes it's listening to the evidence. Uh, I've, I've just come from the UK, where last week there was another huge expose of institutional abuse that was ignored and denied. And I heard a particularly poignant interview with a victim, and what she said was, we were really worried when we heard that this sort of thing didn't happen here, that this sort of thing couldn't happen here. And when you hear that, you then become really to be worried. So uh, I believe that we are increasingly listening to the evidence and increasingly listening to victims. And whilst I'm on the point of leaders, a quick question before I move on. Who are these leaders? Are they the chief executives? Or is it all of us here, as we leave this conference, hopefully enthused and empowered to become leaders on child safeguarding in all of our organizations? We all have the capacity to be leaders on child safeguarding, to be ambassadors of child safeguarding, to be champions of child safeguarding in the way that we know that we can be.
This next section, uh, I've given it the title, What It Isn't, Is, and Could Be. And one of the major steps forward within the Save the Children family has been this struggle in being clear about what we mean uh, in using the term child safeguarding. Some time ago, we had this thing called the child protection policy, which in effect was child safeguarding. But because of the title and because of this ongoing issue about where the boundaries between safeguarding and child protection were, uh, a great deal of confusion existed. So we spent a lot of time in the first few years being clear about what child safeguarding wasn't. It wasn't child protection programming. It has a link with child protection programming because sometimes the staff that work on child protection programming may well have to step up to the plate in terms of child safeguarding, in terms of making our organizational activities safe. So there are obvious links, there are obvious crossovers, but let's be clear that child safeguarding is something distinct. And that's been a big step forward for us all. And the other thing to say is that there is a huge potential for safeguarding. Now, I know I would say this, wouldn't I? But I genuinely believe that if we use safeguarding approaches, then our planning of programs and projects will be that much better, that much stronger. You will be that much more child-focused because if you... If you are to do safeguarding properly, you do need to engage with the children that you're working with. It increases your accountability. What bigger breach of accountability can you think of us going in to do something and ending up harming instead of improving the situation? So there is a huge potential there for increased accountability. And improved activity across the board. So let's just look at this term child safeguarding and we have spent uh, quite a bit of time really trying to find down on child safeguarding, what, what it means. Now we believe that the issue of child abuse occurs everywhere there is a member of staff or uh, a member of our partner staff. Whether it's in and around the offices in London or anywhere in a country program between Afghanistan and Zimbabwe, everybody in the organization, whether they are a, a receptionist, a, a driver, a chief exec, a country director, they all need to know about the issue of child abuse and how to respond to that they will have to respond in different ways. A chief executive will respond in a different way to a field officer. However, we all need to be aware of what the issues are and how to respond. Otherwise, we will respond inappropriately, either by forgetting about it, denying it, or dealing with it in a way which further risks children. So that's the first building block. It's this awareness of the issues and what to do. We think that's, that's the starting block for child safeguarding. Then this is, then is the area around the behavior of our people. Whether they're a trustee, a member of staff, partner agency, consultant, media person, whatever, anybody within our organization um, needs to obey the highest standards of behavior. Because being in this sector comes with trust and authority. It's, it's almost 10 years now uh, since I turned up in a small village in Sri Lanka um, just after the tsunami with a lorry load of food in a village. Now, the only thing that these villagers knew about me was that I had a funny accent and I had a long hair. My hair was longer in those days. The accent was, I'm afraid, <laughs> very much the same. But all they knew about me was that this guy had a T-shirt on, a red T-shirt. And all of a sudden, in that place, on that day, I was extremely influential because nothing else had got through. Now, all of a sudden, this guy from Wales had landed somebody in, in a place 
and is very influential and very powerful. And with that power and influence comes responsibility. We have to do our utmost to ensure that our people never abuse any of the authority. And it is really surprising sometimes how the human condition, if somebody has slightly more than somebody else, that the human condition sometimes encourages just to use that uh, negatively and in a bad way. So that's another key area. And then there's this whole area of our activities and the risks that come with the activities. And I've had many conversations with people across the board. Uh, I've had fundraisers come and tell me, well, this is all very interesting, and I'm sure it applies in, in a field program out in Africa somewhere, but I'm a fundraiser. There aren't any risks in fundraising. Until you find that the man, the nice man with the red T-shirt rattling the bucket outside a concert is a registered sex offender. And then your fundraisers begin to think, oh, campaigns, where's the risk in a campaign? Surely there's no risk in campaign work. We, we do policy work, we do campaigning. Where's the risk there? Until you realize that some of the stories that you have been gathering to support your campaign work are actually witnesses of war crimes. And that two days after these children have freely given their story, the warlords people are in the village and they're looking for them. Until you realize that actually the village where you took your story has now been overrun by the rebels. And they've just given very dangerous testimony. Programs. Well, I suppose people in programs would realize that there are risks. But uh, Christine and I uh, did a visit some time ago to programs and we found out that somebody had used our headed note paper to help them set up a bogus NGO. And when that didn't work, they abandoned some children. Not only did they abandon them, but during the time that they were in their care, they had actually abused those children. Okay? Humanitarian situations. I guess most of us would say that humanitarian situations are, are risky. But again, on, on the same visit, we found that a partner organization had built a latrine near a play area in marshy ground against all of the standards that should have been play, applied and a child drowned in a latrine. Now, there was a huge effort going on to help the general population, but that single death could have been prevented. And again, this is one of Christine's main themes, and I use this a lot, Christine. When you think of all those different areas, it's about doing everything that we can within our control to make our organization safe. And the temptation, particularly in humanitarian situations, is to think that there's not a lot that we control. But when you actually sit down and work it through, there is still an enormous amount within our control that we can do to make children safe. And if you think about it, even within my one organization, we have somewhere around 18,000 members of staff. We honestly don't know how many community-based volunteers work with us. Head office knows of about 1,000 partner organizations, and I suspect, suspect there are a lot more as well. So if you put all of those together, that's not just a, a few people standing up and being strong and safeguarding. That is the beginning of a movement. And when you, all of your organizations and all of the member organizations of keeping children safe do the same, that then is the beginnings of a very strong movement to make this world safer. Okay, back to my board game, Snakes and Ladders. I've seen this issue rise up the agenda and I've seen it slip down the agenda as well. 
One of the things that has helped me enormously is about uh, knowing your audience and seizing your opportunity. And I'm quite shameless, really. I've used virtually any excuse or opportunity to hitch safeguarding onto a particular wagon that's going through. Organizations have themes, have you know these new strategies, these new initiatives, and there is genuinely a real opportunity to latch safeguarding on to whatever uh, is the latest idea in your organization. So know your audiences, seize your chance. And for some of your audiences, it is about the risk, not to children, but the risk to the organization. At some places in an organization, usually somewhere towards the top, there is a lot of talk about risk to the brand, risk to the reputation, risk to the organization. And some people tend to see it that way. Other people see it in terms of children's rights, doing the right thing by children, for children, with children. And you have to actually do both because one without the other ain't going to work. Children's voices are a huge way of taking this forward. Some people um, w get up in the morning to ensure that. We've heard some of them speaking in, in the conference already. But for others, it's around accountability and governance. So you have to know your audience. You have to seize your chance. I've seen safeguarding move from the margins, somewhere out there, something that's added on, something that's thought about once a year when we do the audit, to being brought in to the mainstream. And that has taken a huge amount of effort and, and a number of steps. Where we are now is that we have our minimum operating standards what we call our quality framework, key performance indicators that, that reflect child safeguarding. And that's an Im immensely important where, part of the work where safeguarding is actually in the day-to-day -day running of a country office or a country program. And that is part of a spectrum. Probably the best day's work I did was when the new Save the Children International Organization was being established was to work with some of our leaders to ensure that right at the very start that the law of Save the Children included safeguarding. There were only two laws at the start of Save the Children. We call them a protocol. There were only two. One was intellectual property. So what's the logo? What's our mission? What's our values? And what do we do around child safeguarding, the do no harm principle in child safeguarding. And right at the start of the Save the Children International journey, the protocol uh, included child safeguarding. Now, Paul Nolan, who's here, did something very similar in terms of the old Save the Children Alliance. So what we did was when SCI was formed, was to, again to ensure that the protocol was there. It's the law around here. And from the law comes the policy. From the policy come the standards. With the standards come the procedures. With the standards and the procedures come guidance and tools. And with all of that comes auditing and checking. So slowly, slowly, we've built up uh, across the board from the protocol for, from the big law to the auditing and the checking and it has taken a, a long time and you know as I said right at the start we are, we are very thankful and grateful for the people that have helped us uh, along this journey and we are getting there uh, in integrating mainstream and managerial systems so it will be reflected in monitoring and budgets and this will be the first year in our organization the new organization's history where we'll be able to see that and also that it's integrated in the day-to-day -day people systems the the recruitment the inductions and and the performance issues and we've just established this this brilliant global 
um, human resource information system that can tell us real time how many people have received their training and how many people have had issues around behavior. It's a brilliant system. It's only got one failure. It requires people to ensure that the system is working. <laughs> so, as I say, glass is half empty or half full. I'd also like to say that we have moved away from guesswork. Um, I wonder if you could ask yourself, just ask yourself a question. Um, is my organization safe for children? And at different times, I've had to honestly say, well, I guess so. Nobody's told me any different. Or maybe, well, we've had no complaints. But if you haven't got that system, if you're not looking for things, then it is, I'm afraid, simply guesswork. So we've been on a journey, and a number of organizations and part of the wider Keeping Children Safe family have been on a journey from self-certification, saying to ourselves, are we doing enough on child safeguarding? Yes or no? You know, not many people tick the no box. So moving from self-certification on through enforcement, and we've done that through getting our audit departments involved, doing external, <laughs> I love it, eternal auditing. I did mean external <laughs> auditing. I've been through this bloody presentation 10 times. <laughs> and of course, I meant eternal auditing, <laughs> never ending auditing. <laughs> Forever auditing. Okay, I know. External auditing, I mean. Peer review, you know, get, get in different organizations to review each other, and external verification. And I do want to make a big plug for the Keeping Children Safe certification scheme here because we believe that that is uh, another step forward but to do this you do need the big guns behind you you do need the board behind you you've got to work with them and that's why this thing around the protocol was so important and so every six months I've got to go back in front of our board and I remember the very first time I met the board our board is chaired by um, a very strong character uh, and in the very first meeting I attended, he asked me a very direct question. How do I know any of this is any good? What does good look like? Okay, and the honest answer is, unless we really try and find out, unless we really look, unless we test, we can't answer that question properly. It still is guesswork, I'm afraid. Compliance, as I've said, is one thing. To build a real culture is much more of hearts and minds, winning people's hearts and minds. Applying standards, compliance is one thing. We've got to take our people with us and move from the not-dos to the do's. And that is about internalizing. I had some really good conversations yesterday with Lucy uh, around how we can internalize and build up those sort of behaviors um, and the beliefs and the culture. And there is some really good evidence that shows it's far easier to deter people who are unsuitable to work with children to come into our agencies if we have built up that culture. It does give off very strong messages to people who just shouldn't be in this line of business. This next one is isolation to inclusion. And if anybody's ever done any child safeguarding investigations, you will know that this is a very lonely job this is a very isolated job. 
um, and you're dealing with issues of sensitivity and confidentiality that even very often the person set, sat next to you, uh, you know, doesn't need to know that. So there has been a journey from isolation to inclusion, and I said it's, it's great to work from a team. And that isolation can be around personal things. At one time uh, in Save the Children UK, uh, I heard our media people saying when I walked into a room, oh, here he comes, it's that bloody Hercule Poirot again. <laughs> For those of you who don't know who Hercule Poirot is, he was a fictional detective uh, in English literature who only turned up either just before or just after somebody died. So it was always, <laughs> always bad news to have Hercule Poirot around the place. And uh, it was said, here he comes again, Hercule Poirot. Uh, so we moved on from there. The other isolation is within the organization we tend to think of safeguarding as either being a human resource issue or a child protection issue or somebody else's issue in between all of these. And we've had so many examples of people assuming it's all about that department, it's all about them people, and not really taking ownership. And silo mentality uh, it has been a challenge. When you're doing this, you will need friends. You will need to create allies. And I, my best buddy in, in the London office at the moment is the guy who leads on fraud. Now, he says he's learning from safeguarding, but I tell you what, I am learning an awful lot from him about the way he looks at fraud. And organizational uh, isolation. I don't have time to tell you about the mission that Colin Tucker and I did <laughs> to Haiti. It's a very, very long story. Perhaps you could do it tonight. Um, but one of the things that Colin and I found, we went on a Keeping Children Safe mission to Haiti, uh, was that organizations were so pleased to hear other organizations just talking honestly about this, just admitting that they were worried about it, admitting that they had issues around this. Some of these conversations will be difficult, but as I've told you, what we've done is to try and turn that and to work on positive communication strategies. And being forced, and I was forced, I was sat down in a chair and said, right, oh, who are your audiences? Starting with the chair of the board of trustees, through the audience, who are your audiences? What do they need to know? What do they need to feel? And what do they need to do in terms of child safeguarding? And from all that, after doing it, is really detailed hard work. But after you've done that, we've came, come to the core talking points and the communication channel, channels. And so we've come, after all that work, all we've ended up with is one line. Okay? Huge amount of effort get into one line. Save the children, safe for children. In terms of the issue of resources, there is a phrase that's around. I, I don't often use it because um, I'm not very good with money. Uh, for, if you want to know what's happening, follow the money, okay? Where are the, the resources? I mentioned some research that Christine and I did. We visited the Horn of Africa just after um, a major, major humanitarian ramp-up. And we looked at, at budgets, literally tens and tens of millions of dollars of budget. And could we see uh, expenditure that was dedicated to child safeguarding in all these budgets? No. People would tell us, well, there's a little bit here, there's a little bit there. But it was never clear in the way that other things, like maybe safety and security were clear, that safeguarding wasn't clearly identified in the resources. We are improving, but we've still got a huge way to go. We're addressing this to our standards. And Mubarak, part of the team, recently worked out how much the proposed expenditure in one of his regions was going to be. I can't tell you that, otherwise he'd have to kill me because it's a trade secret. But I can tell you it's still a very small percentage in terms of the overall expenditure. But it is a step forward. And sometimes... Some of this work doesn't require big resources. It requires much more of a mental attitude. 
We've talked about this role of donors. I'd love to spend a lot more time on this, but we have heard the beginnings of a discussion between donors and ourselves, the, um, a dialogue that I really do hope today was a starting point for that, a kickoff for that, because there's this old phrase in Europe, they who pay the piper call the tune, and it's our job to tell the people who are paying the piper what we think about safeguarding and how we can include safeguarding in their donors. And in another lifetime, I was chair of a, of a small, uh, well, not that small, uh, fund for the BBC. And we found by changing the requirement from do you have a child safeguarding policy or show us evidence of an implementing child safeguarding policy by simply changing that, our assessors were then engaging far more than saying, have you got a policy? And really taking that forward. And um, the final area here is sharing across the sector. As I said, this is genuinely one of those areas where we put our Save the Children hats down. I've been banging on about Save the Children a lot, I know. But as I said at the start, it's, it, that's just for illustration. Um, there's real genuine sharing across agencies. When we've got problems, we can turn to each other. But there is still an, more that we can do. The Keeping Children Network safe has been brilliant. They encourage you to engage with interagency working and sharing of resources because, as we've seen downstairs, some really good resources that maybe we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And to wind up this session, and hopefully I just, I'm just going to go through these quickly, uh, the tough challenges, the ones that really um, are there, we still haven't done enough about interagency sharing of pro problems. We still could have somebody who's dismissed from Save the Children or who leaves Save the Children under a cloud rocking up in some NGO somewhere and saying, I've worked with Save the Children, and we may never, ever get to hear of that. So there's still a lot more that we can do to share our problems. We need some sort of forum that is legal. You know, this often comes up that, that you've got to be within the law with some interagency way. Donors just talked about that to encourage the, the dialogue we started this morning, to encourage that to carry on. Humanitarian situations pose huge issues. I've just mentioned a couple. It's an extremely complex sector, and there's far more that we can be doing. Uh, and in terms of the cases that are reported, extremely few unbelievably few cases come through the humanitarian situation route. Working with, encouraging, building up partners, especially when they're government partners or members of a wider organization, is a challenge. We're not doing half enough, not doing quarter enough of working with children on safeguarding, working with them to help them safeguard themselves. We have developed some materials within Keeping Children Safe. I've seen some really good examples in some of the other agencies. There was some really good stuff on the plan stand. But overall, across the sector, we still believe that we can do this better than on our own than working with children. And there is still this huge issue. The second speaker was talking about uh, physical punishment yesterday morning. We have so many staff who are working in communities where some of the traditional practices really do butt up against a child's rights approach. And speaking for my own organization, we have cupboards full of strategies, policies, materials to tell the outside world about what they should do about some of these traditional practices, but very, very little about what to help would help a member of staff living in one of these communities many miles from the office uh, about things that are happening in, in their village, in their community, and in their family. So a huge challenge there. So save the children, save for children. After my talk, you want to put a big question mark there. I know. I don't mind. But I think I've just allowed a little bit of time. Yeah. <laughs> 
just a little bit of time for questions. Uh, I'm very happy to take questions and answer them if they're easy. If they are difficult, I will pass them over to the team because I'm sure they... <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Um, I am going to allow some time for questions because you've got two tea breaks this afternoon. So uh, we're going to encroach on this one for a little bit. So questions and comments from... The, oh, my goodness. Well, we're cancelling the tea break then. Um, Tricia first um, and then Christine, please. Hi. Um, I know you said that um, you felt that more could be done to engage and listen to children in these processes. I'm just really curious to know in your own journey in Save the Children, what, what you were able to do in terms of engaging and listening to children. Okay, let's see. I'm going to take two or three questions. So, Christine, please. Thank you very much for your presentation. I just wondered um, what order you would uh, recommend in relation to building a culture of safeguarding and writing a policy for safeguarding. Uh, because um, to save the children uh, commended RAPCAN to work with international partners around ch child safeguarding. And normally, it's people think that they just need to write the policy. And that's enough to do things. And we've turned that on its head and said, in actual fact, we have a workshop called Changing Hearts and Minds. And that starts first uh, uh, for us, because unless you have that culture, the paper policy really means nothing for, for us. Thank you. Another question? Uh, yes, uh, David, who's... Uh... Um, it's more of an observation, if I may, Richard. Thank you very much for that wonderful example of Welsh Ubuntu, I think. <laughs> um, I've been a lawyer in the UK for 30 years doing criminal law, and it strikes me, listening to what's happening here, there are direct parallels, because I've spent a lot of my time doing child abuse cases. And it started some 25 years ago when the system was very reluctant to accept that there was such a social problem. The profession was very reluctant to accept there was such a problem. And it started from a trickle that we dealt with very reluctantly to an utter tidal wave, such that I found myself dealing with very little else. But what I want to say is that complaints are a sign of success, because it means three things, really. Children have faith in the system, because previous children have been dealt with appropriately. The system is working. And there is a continuum beyond those complaints within the system, if necessary, to social welfare report, uh, support and the criminal justice system. So I just want to say complaints means, mean a good thing. It means the system is working. And I guess the, the challenge here, I'm saying this as an outsider and a newcomer to this business, it's reconciling the funders and the donors to that reality. Great, thanks. Why don't you answer those? Okay, thank you. Uh, the first question was around engaging children. Um, uh, the honest answer is not enough. Um, in individual parts of the organization, there, there are pockets of good practice. Uh, I'm going to ask Menica to talk about something that she's been working on, one of the directors of Child Safeguarding. Um, the other area where we did invest and worked with Keeping Children Safe was on the adaptations to the uh, implementation uh, guidelines and the uh, toolkit, uh, toolkit around uh, child participation and increased safeguarding through participation. So uh, when I look across the piece, uh, it's sporadic, some really good work. Uh, a lot to learn within the um, standards, the operational standards I talked. Again, there are some standards there, and we'll have to see how they shake out. But um, there is still a huge amount left to do. Menica, perhaps you could talk quickly about some of the work you've done with children? Menica's or maybe not? here, if you can pass the microphone. Put your hands up, Menica, just so that the... Uh... Is there anything on uh, the work that you've done in uh, consulting with children on the safeguarding policy. 
Um, yeah, my name is Menaka. I uh, am part of uh, Richard's team. I cover Asia, uh, and some of the uh, some of the work that I'm currently doing is uh, with children, um, and to see how uh, we have a policy and we don't have a child-friendly version of it. So my work, uh, which I've uh, recently started, is about you know asking from children. If uh, if there was an organization, uh, you know, without giving them the policy and you know asking them to do a child-friendly version, but asking them what they would expect from us, what kind of behavior and what kind of uh, standards that they would expect us to have, and then turning that into the child-friendly version of our own policy. So very briefly, that's that's the work that I've currently engaged in. It was a Thanks. Christian's organisation that helped us with the child participation toolkit. Wonderful. So uh, that's that's great. Yeah. And then there was a, a question over there uh, on the order. Yes. Um, the, the way in which we've approached it is to use a multi-track approach. And we haven't done one thing before the other. We've, as I was saying, in knowing your audience, you do tailor things slightly more dif differently. So if you're talking to um, the internal auditors or the risk people, you tend to focus more on the risk side. Uh, with others, you focus a bit more on the child's rights side. Mm -hmm. But you need to be doing both of those at the same time. So it, it isn't a, sort of a linear approach it is a multi-track it's probably doing two or three things at a time but but you're quite right it is about engaging hearts and minds um, you know the minds with the standards and the implementation and the compliance and the training but also the hearts because at the end of the day our, our people go home uh, they, they work in very isolated situations and unless they believe in this then uh, you know all the standards in the world aren't going to help us. Did you just want to comment? Oh, and, and I, 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 I did want to agree. And this is a conversation that I've been having with uh, trustees for many years. And I've told you that this year we will be publishing our uh, figures. They're still low figures, but we will be publishing them publicly. And so we have this conversation. So the trustees say, well, what if the figures go up next year, Richard? Okay, and so I say, yeah, well, really, the curve that we want to see is increased reporting. I am really concerned that in humanitarian situations, we have so few reports that that just can't be right. We, we know some of the work that HAP have done uh, about uh, to, to report or not to report um, was crucial in this. So increased reporting is good. And when Charlie asks me, you know, what does good look like? I have to say, look, Charlie, we really do need to be seeing a lot more cases going through this and then trying to understand understand it. Thanks. Uh, Fasil and then Ignacio. Can we have a, sorry, put your hands up, Fasil, just so that the uh, mic man. Thank you for a good presentation. Uh, my question is that the Save the Children is working with partners, local partners. How do you roll out to your partners and what are the challenges that you have faced in you know, rolling it out? And you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it looks very good when you're presenting it and practically rolling it out to partners. How, that's what I want to know. Okay, thanks. And can we just take the mic down to Ignacio? Put your hand. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I just wanted to come back to one point that Richard uh, said that I think is so important. Is that early for us it's difficult to understand uh, child safeguarding, protection and so on. The top management has it even more difficult. We should have more top management people here. The choice of the organization I'm working with, well, I'm the Secretary General of the Federation. And when I entered into the function I said I want 5% of my time on child safeguarding. That's why I can be here. We should have more of the top people to listen and to understand what's going on. Because if not, they can't take the decisions for the resources. Yeah. Ignacio, you, you might be interested in knowing that um, in the interest of time, uh, <laughs> I've actually got a line on my notes there. Say, the higher you go, the harder it gets. And you know, sometimes um, those conversations, the higher you go, 
the harder they get. Now, I, I've been lucky because with some senior people in Save the Children, they, they, they get it. And not only do they get it, they push for it. So that, that's, that's been good. But I do know uh, of other instances where the higher you go, the more difficult it is for people to, to see the whole picture. Um, I don't know if I'm expressing it properly, but uh, yeah. Do you want to respond to Fassel's thing? On the oh, partners, then? yeah. Right. Um, we took uh, a strategic decision in um, Save the Children UK 10 years ago, more maybe, that um, one, one of the ways in which we would encourage uh, our partner organizations to develop their policies and procedures would be to support the keeping children safe approach. So the whole idea of the standards, the implementation guidelines, and the training material, really that that was the sort of um, idea be behind, at least part of the idea behind us, supporting Keeping Children Safe. So through Keeping Children Safe, we've been able to see the development, and now they're a charity in their own right, and they do, uh, you know, got their own activities, um, a whole body of work that could take an organization, a partner organization, from having nothing to working up you know, a fully uh, fledged and workable approach. I'm not going to say policy, I'm going to say approach that works. So we took that decision. The other way that we've, um, we've included it and bringing it into the mainstream is that it is part of the partner assessment process. So remember I talked about bringing it in from the margins to the mainstream. So partner assessments have got that and in the partner standards there are those issues around their safeguarding uh, approaches. Again, there is a huge amount more to be doing. And, and in some places, there are some country offices that have really flown this and are really doing really well. There are some really good examples. There are others where um, it's, it's still not strong enough, still not good enough. And uh, I, I'm reminded of an occasion where I did actually travel to Bangladesh, which is now really strong in this. And I traveled all the way from Wales to Bangladesh, and I was doing safeguarding training, and there were only 12 people in the room. And I was thinking to myself, I've come all the way from Wales to here, and there are 12 people in the room. I found out that each one of these 12 people was a HR director for an NGO that had more staff than Save the Children UK, okay? So, you know, engaging with partners does open, you know, a huge vista for you, but there's still more to be done. Like I say, on everything that I've said that we progressed on, there's still a huge amount left to do. Okay, I'm, I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to close the this session down now. Um, sorry, I know you've got some questions, but we're going, you will have an opportunity to explore further what's happening in the aid and development community in the sessions that are coming up. And when we come back together, we'll have like a final opportunity to share thoughts. So please hold the questions that you had and then come back at, at the end and we'll, we'll consider those. So now, I, well, let me just say thank you. That was Welcome. magic. I'll give you a kiss afterwards. <laughs> and then uh, please go and take your tea um, before moving on to your next session of choice. Thank you. That was brilliant. You seriously excited.